Greetings. And welcome back to another segment of God's awesome, anointed, holy word that we all need to hear, including myself. You know, I'm not excluded from this. What, what is coming from me is not of me. It is of God. I just want to make sure you guys know that. That it's for you and for, it's for everybody, okay? And it dawned on me when I was uh, reading a chapter today in the Bible, of course. And in there, I was reading in uh, John chapter 9. If you have a Bible, you can turn to there and read the chapter yourself. But I'm going to be pulling uh, references from that scripture. And so... As I was going through, you know, in, in the passage, you know, Jesus, uh, he sees a blind man. There's a blind man, and uh, his disciples ask him, you know, who sinned? You know, because did his parents sin or did he sin? Because usually if you have an infirmity, if you have something physically wrong with your body that's not supposed to be there, uh, or whatever uh, symptoms you got or your conditions or your body's in, like say like cancer, uh, deformity, and etc. And if you have those infirmities, it's possibly due because of a sin you've committed or a sin your parents committed. So a generational, uh, well, a generational curse. And Jesus goes and states to them, no, this man, neither his parents nor himself have sinned because of his blindness. He, he, so he didn't get, you know, blind because of the sin of his parents or the sin of himself because he didn't have none. And right here in the scripture, it says, Neither has this man sinned, this is Jesus saying this, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. See, the thing is, I see it as uh, when God, sorry, it's my phone. God has things certain planned out. Like some things we can't, we can't even begin to describe or fathom that, like why it happened. Like some people are born, uh, you know, in a state of mental retardation or disfigured, you know, doesn't come out with all their body parts, you know, such infirmities. But I've, and, you know, and they're not because of a sin of the, you know, generational curse that was passed down, nor the sin of them. It's more than likely God had it that way because perhaps God wants to work a miracle through you or through someone around you to cleanse that person to heal that person of their infirmity so that people can witness the glory of God and God can bring more people in into his kingdom into being a soldier of Christ. And you know and you know you can say that's not fair. Like why would God do that? That's not fair. Like I said, it's not just about a specific person. It's about majority. It's about everyone. God wants to get as many people as he can into his kingdom because he loves us. He wants every, he he welcomes everybody. But in some cases, he probably has to make somebody sick to have a loved one come to, you know, to uh, nurture that one into health or to bring a whole group together to possibly, you know, more than likely pray, which should go down for their sickness to be, you know, relieved from them. But uh, in this case, it was to see God's work manifest through the man. And this man, if you go later on, he doesn't know who the Son of God is. Like when you read on to the scripture, okay, so Jesus... Jesus heals the man, okay? He uh, spits into the dirt and makes clay out of it and rubs it on his eyes and tells him, go wash into the pools of Siloam. It's a pools of water where, you know, you can get yourself clean from. And once he does, the man, boom, he can see, okay? And so later on, while the man can, like, physically see now that he's healed from his blindness, God comes to him later, Okay? Actually, you know, let me rewind that back. So the Pharisees and Sadducees detest everything that God does. God did this healing on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to lift a finger. You're not supposed to work. You're not supposed to do anything that's, uh, that's, that's labor. You're supposed to relax and just, you know, take a load off pretty much. Not do anything. So they consider God's work a miracle. I mean, his miracle at work, which it is. Because God says right here. I must work the works of him that sent me. God sent Jesus. Jesus is God. They are one together. 
I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So God is the light of the world. God dwells within every single one of us. Jesus does. And, oh, actually, I want to uh, refer to something in that scripture right there. Um, the way I take that, as long as, like he says, as long as I am in the world, and I am, I am the light of the world. It's basically saying people, you know, they work, okay? While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. That's what God's saying. Like, you work during the day, and you go to sleep at night. But you have people who do night shifts, graveyard shifts, um, <laughs> it doesn't apply to you. But if you catch my drift, what I'm trying to get at is that God's saying that his work is continued. It's a continuance. It's a, it never stops. It just keeps going. So he's saying that as long as he's in the world, his work is day and night. Do miracles in the day, miracles at night, prayings in the morning, prayings at night. It's never-ending process. Now, if you do the works of the Father, which is God's works, what God tells you to do, it's nonstop. Till the day your flesh decays and gives up on you, and you give up your ghost and you go to heaven, you're not going to stop working. Like people, uh, they, they push themselves to work a physical job, right? A regular, uh, you know, 24-hour job all day, every day, 9 to 5 or whatever the schedule may be. See, Jesus, it's not, it, doesn't, it never stops. The weekends you don't get rest. But you do have rest in God because your rest is that you're giving people peace and you're giving them salvation, which is God. So you are giving them rest, but at the same time working. So the way I take that, like I told you, it's never ending, never stops, even on Sunday. You know how Sunday, you know, most re uh, religious people or Christian goers or Christians, they uh, they go to a service on Sunday for about a couple hours. Then they come home and they just take the load off. They don't do anything, right? You know, it's, it's your free day. It's your day off. With God, it's just like it's never ending process. See, even on the days that you think you're off, you are not off if you're a believer of Christ. Or if you need to come to know God, you will know that His work is always. And I've I've learned to adapt. Like I'm learning to adapt to that. It's like coming to a realization that hey, <laughs> God's work is continuing. It just it never ends. So it's it's pretty miraculous. It's not tiresome because if it becomes a passion, you love doing it. It's not a job. Like people that have professions, their jobs don't become work. It becomes their passion. And they love doing it, so it's not a job to them. It just becomes like, hey, this is my fun time. Let's do this. So serving God becomes that because it's not just preaching the gospel. It's not just doing miracles. You get to do other things too. Even though the preaching and the miracles are miraculous things, there's so much more that we can't even begin to fathom. And the only way that you can begin to grasp that is if you establish a relationship with Christ. But anyways, on to what I was saying about uh, the man being healed. So God, God works in many ways. So it wasn't sin that made him blind. It was made that way so God can show this miraculous work. And I'm saying God, he's the light of the world. And if, like I said, if you accept Jesus, he's within you, every single one of us. If you accept him, he's in you. And even if you don't, he is still in there. He's the source of life. So God is in you 24-7, all day, every day. When you breathe, when you eat, when you sleep, when you use the restroom, he is everywhere you go you cannot avoid him he's there so once you come to uh realizing that god is everywhere and you want to accept him into your life you will start be your light will shine god's light in you will shine and everybody will glorify god which is in you so god was glorified if you go later on into the chapter the pharisees and sadducees hate god Okay, they hate Jesus. They just downright hate him. They hate his works. They hate the fact they try to make an excuse like you worked on the Sabbath day. We hate you. You're not abiding by the laws of Moses. Yada yada yada. Okay, and we're like the Pharisees and Sadducees at time. Come on, we are. So, excuse me. They take the blind man, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they ask him, "Who did this to you?" And he says, "A man named Jesus." Because this guy doesn't know that he's the Messiah. This blind man does not know that he's the Messiah, but he does know that he did a miraculous miracle on him and made him see. He received his sight. So this guy's just blown by him, okay? And so they ask him to repeat it a couple times. And the man's like, okay, uh, I already told you once, but I'll tell you again. 
But before he tells him a second time, they actually call his parents to ask him, was this man born blind, right? Was he? Or was this a lie? They wanted to make sure... Actually, what they wanted was to make sure that it's a lie, that it didn't happen, that this guy wasn't born blind, that just, you know, it's just a charade or whatever. (laughs) 